Hello, everybody. This is Founder Leroon. I'm here with Lady Shell. We are on episode 11, running your first combat and campaign in Unity. Um, we're going to go through the setup of the encounters and such. We're going to talk a little bit about maps, not line of sight so much, but just some real basic stuff. And we're going to run a combat. Um, Lady Shell is actually on the table. She suggested that uh, she help me on that because sometimes it takes longer when you only have the DM running it. Um, so we're going to get started. Um, basically, if you watched episode 10, we led up to laying out the table and, and kind of getting ready and how all the data was related. Now we're going to actually start running the campaign. So first of all, I'm going to first thank Lady Shell for helping, and I'd like her to say a couple words. Couple words. No, I'm only kidding. Hey everyone, welcome to our stream today. And um, yeah, I'll be on the table so you can watch me play this cleric. What is this? this is a hill dwarf cleric? Uh, I believe it's one of the ones from uh, Fandelver, the module itself. But we just changed it to a female, so mm -hmm. I stuck my little picture on there, and uh, I'll be uh, hopefully not dying. All right. So this is typically where I would say um, half or if not more of the people who use Fantasy Grounds get a little bit confused. It is something that takes time to get practiced with. And you want to set up a organized way that you do this every time. I'm going to show you that part of it, and then we're going to do the combat. And we're going to make some comments and notes in between that. But for the most part, we're going to set up session zero and session one. And then we'll talk about a couple auxiliary things, and, and that's what we're going to work on. All right, so let's get going. So I have Lady Shell's character up here. And she's already on the table. And we're going to pretend that she made this character or that she was assigned this character. Or she picked it. So this particular character is part of the module. So Lost Mine of Fandelver that we have loaded in our library is a part of this, this module. And this character is from that particular source. So these can be imported through the PC area. I've already went through and imported these just for the sake of time. But if you want to import them, there's an import button. And if you have the, the module loaded, you'll see the other characters that you can import into the campaign. So these are all the pregens that come with uh, Lost Mine of Foundelver. So if you've gone through character creation with your players, then you'll want to put them on the combat tracker. So I have Lady Shell up there already. I'm going to add this folk hero fighter, a human noble fighter, a halfling rogue criminal, and a wizard acolyte. This is a female wizard. So we have two females uh, and three males, a party of five. And this will be a setup for the combat. But right now, I'm just showing you how to set up for the campaign. So I have all the characters on the combat tracker. Now that that's happened, I'm going to go over to, on the right-hand side, there's these banners. I want you to look for one that's called... Uh, up on the very top right corner of the party sheet. And that's a little button up here on the top right. And the view that I'm in right now is Game Master mode. So I'm in the Game Master mode, GM. And that shows all these banners that I need. So I'm going to drag over all of the characters on the party sheet. On to, I'm going to put them on the party sheet so that they are now part of the campaign. And this party sheet is going to be your best friend and also the combat tracker. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to tell all the players to meet me today at X time. And, and we're going to get together and go over the characters and we'll do like a session zero. Or maybe we'll have to finish building characters, whatever it might be. You always, wants to have, you always want to have some sort of meetup before the actual campaign starts. So I will assume that Lady Shell and I picked this character for her beforehand. She has it. She should be studying it right now, going over the spells, you know, those sort of things. 
Um, and then if she had any questions about the tabs or any of your character options on here, then she could ask, you know, that, that sort of thing. So it's important to have this type of session zero set up. The other thing for you for organization purposes is that I'm going to show you a method that helps focus, organize, and compartmentalize what you're going to be doing. So this first session, I don't want to worry about maps and all that kind of stuff. I'm going to worry about um, actually what am I going to do for session zero. So I'm going to go ahead and open up the calendar as a tool, which comes with Fantasy Ground. It is a module that you have to load, which I've already done that just for the sake of time. And there's different types of calendars. Some are focused for games, uh, specific settings. In this case, I'm just going to use our regular Gregorian calendar, and that's what's set here. So to use the calendar, you have to put in the year, which I'll put 2020. The era is not as important, but I'm going to put AD. If you were in the Forgotten Realms, you would put like DR, Dell Reckoning, or whatever calendar system you're using. And then to change the time, you single click in the hour field, you hold the right control key, and then you just mouse forward, and that actually advances the time. So I want to go towards, right now for me, it's like 4 p.m., and then maybe change the minutes to 30. And I asked all the players to meet me here at 4.30 because that's what I had planned for. So this session zero setup that I'm doing would have been done before we, before we, you know, or the day that we decided to get together, I'd have all this situated. Once you have all that in there, you click on the set date for the calendar after you choose your day. So we're going to go with the 20th of December, which is down here. And that's Sunday. That matches today. So if I click here, that brings up this calendar uh, entry, like a journal entry. And then I click set day and calendar. And it actually is highlighted now with this black square. So this is set. The calendar is set for today. And this is the journal entry that I would fill out before the party members uh, arrive. So in this GM table, I can see both the player and the GM part. But I'm just going to put here, I'm just going to put, uh, you know, notes or whatever, uh, session zero. So I'm guessing that the players will only see the things that you write in the player section, correct? Yes, that is absolutely right. I had a question about the calendar. Um, you sure. had the calendar already selected, mm -hmm. but um, it's something you need to load in your library first, correct? Yes. It's a free module that comes with the library, um, with, with the uh, base program. And you can make your own, but you have to learn how to build extensions, and we're not going to do that. But for the most part, this calendar is free. It's part of Fantasy Grounds. You don't have to use it. I'm showing you a way to incorporate it into Fantasy Grounds as a tool. Yeah, I just put a comment in the chat saying that a lot of people don't take advantage of using the calendar, but it can really help you with your planning, and especially at your you know, beginning of session zero. Well, yep. any session, but especially in session zero. Right. So now, if you wanted to output these dates and time into chat, you could. I don't know any reason why you would, but you can click on these bubbles, and that sends the time and the dates and such into the chat window. So that data that's in the chat window can be drug over to any form field, pretty much. So I would put just a note reminder there. And then if I want to add the time, I could also do that. So that's, you know, one way to utilize this thing here. The other is I'm going to bring up some notes. 
pretty much the notes just stay with the campaign. You can't really export it. If you want to keep your note, you should use a story entry instead of notes. I don't really mind because I'm only going to use this for this session. And if I'm really obsessed with keeping my notes, I'll copy and paste them onto a, a Word doc so I can use them anywhere. So anyhow, I'm going to go ahead and click the edit button on the bottom right. Or you can right click and click on create item. This is going to be my notes just for session zero pretty much. And I'm going to link this calendar entry into the session zero notes. So I'm just going to take this pin that's on the top left of this journal entry and drag and drop it into the notes. So that puts the link straight to my journal entry. Then the journal entry itself, I want to have quick access to it, and if I need to, the note. So I'm going to go ahead and drag and drop this next link here from the note onto the actual field entry for the 20th of December. So now I have a note here that will bring up my notes when I need them. And then if I'm in my notes, I can bring up my calendar or my journal entry. So they're linked together back and forth so it's easier for you to get to one or the other. So I always link things back and forth if I can, if it makes sense. Uh, the other thing is I'm gonna add more notes, but for now I'll close the calendar entry and the calendar itself. And now, I just wanted I, I just wanted to say as a player I was able to load the calendar and uh, I see the day of two, uh, December twentieth is uh, highlighted on the calendar and when I clicked on it it has a little pin in it and when I clicked on it it does tell me that same what you had put in the uh, player's note start a campaign date is twentieth December twenty twenty A D time is four thirty p.m. so cool. just just so you guys know from the player side what you see. Cool. Thank you. So now the next thing is, oh, by the way, the notes are private unless you make them public. So you, the players don't see the notes unless you share it. And then you would click public in that case. Um, so the next thing I'm going to do is I want a roster of my players. So I'm going to start a new section. I'm just going to call this players. and over here on the combat tracker for quick access so i don't have to mess around with this is i'm going to go ahead and drag all the players onto the map or onto the notes and those will be directly shortcutted from the combat tracker so if for some reason I just want to study out of the notes. I can pop this up and not have to worry about, you know, getting into the entire campaign to get to here. So here's all the players. And if you notice, I have them all layered, including Lady Shell's character. So what that does is when I go down this list on the combat tracker, which is on the far right side, there's these little buttons or pins. They're on the combat tracker all the way to the right along the edge. When I click on those, it brings up the character sheet that I want to look at. So here's Lady Shells. And I'm on the combat actions mode. I go to the next character. Same thing, combat actions. So on and so forth. If you place them here in this type of way, it's going to help you a lot because as you go through combat or any sort of uh, combat tracker related um, events, this will be so much easier for you to access than trying to reinvent a wheel and moving things around and such. So managing your windows is important. As you can see, this layout, I have the dice tower. I have this, this uh, chat area. I have the combat tracker. Up above here is where all the players will be connected. And then I have all my players' character sheets layered in one pile here 
so that when I had need access to them, whether it be from my note or from the combat tracker, I can pull them up quickly and they'll all be in the same location. That's the key. Once they're in this location, you don't want to move them. And that's true of all these windows. You want to try to keep them where you want them to pop up. And that is the key to, to managing windows in Fantasy Grounds. So now um, I have my player, but I don't know who they are. So for example, I know this is Lady Shell. I will put her email address, her, her Discord name, her username, whatever it takes for you to keep track of where this person is. Because if you have to email people or get a hold of them, you want to know who they are. And if you only know their character name or their real name, it's going to be hard to track them down. So make a roster of your players in your Session Zero notes. And that way you'll always have that. And then I'm just going to highlight this and make this a header. So what's that? Control 2. Yep, Control 2. I highlighted the text. That makes this red header type thing. The next step is the research. I'm going to run Lost Mine of Van Delver. So honestly, I would be looking at videos. I would be doing some reading online to see what other people have done. I would actually go into the module, dig in there to find out what it's about. And I'd start getting a feel for the lore and for how these characters fit in if you're going to use the pre-existing. Um, there's all kinds of research that you can do to make life easier on you in the beginning. So for right now, I'm going to grab the module from the story entries. We went over all these banners in the last episode. And then I'm going to filter this group that we showed you like last time, last episode. And this takes me to the beginning of Lost Mine. This is a chapter one. This is the actual uh, credits and, and all that sort of thing. So there's a background which tells you why things are the way they are. So I'll study that. There is a overview. This tells you how the module runs from A to, to Z, basically. And it gives you a, you know, how it's supposed to go together, all the chapters. There's an adventure hook, which is something that you usually have to come up with on your own. They give you a suggestion here, and I, if you're not experienced, I suggest you use it. If you're not um, comfortable coming up with your own, you can always use their adventure hook. And this is what you use to bring everyone together in the beginning. It's kind of like the lure that brings you into the campaign. And then there's a section here about the Forgotten Realms. I don't think uh, everyone knows about the Forgotten Realms. Maybe some of you do, some of you don't. Maybe two-thirds do, a third don't. I don't know. But I would bring this down, too, if you're not familiar. And these are the things that you're going to be studying in addition to whatever else you find. If you find a link, like a wiki page or something that you like, you can actually um, drag and drop that into your chat window and drag the link up to your session zero notes and then it will be clickable and then you can just click on it and it will take you to the website so that you can create links if you need to within fantasy grounds you first put it in the chat area and then you hit enter and it makes a link and then you drag and drop that up to your notes or to your story entry and that will create a link that goes to an internet site but in this case i'm not using that so here I'm going to go ahead and bold this again, Control 2, after I highlight the text. This is the research that I want to do for Session 0. I'm going to read about the, the, the background, what led up to the adventure. I'm going to look at the overview, which tells you how all this is supposed to come together, how it runs. The adventure hook gives you ideas on how to bring the group together. So in this case, they tell you to meet everybody in the city of Neverwinter. 
So you'll tell your players you're going to start off with Neverwinter and that they should do a little research on their own to get an idea of what Neverwinter is about. Because you're really not going to adventure a whole lot in Neverwinter unless your DM sets it up that way. You're just going to be leaving from there and using it kind of like a home base. But as a game master and players, I would hope that you would all do that so that if you did have to go back and do a little one shot in there, that would be a good thing. Um, also, this kind of tells you where things lead and who's your patrons, who's paying for the uh, the journey, what the journey um, entails in context of the lore of the area. So there's two patrons. There's Sildar Hallwinter. He's a noble warrior type. And then there's also um, some brothers. They're dwarves. And it's Gundren Rockseeker, and he's got two other brothers. Supposedly, one of the characters, a.k.a. Lady Shell's character, might be related to Gundren Rockseeker because they're both dwarves. Now, they don't have to be. I but... am. I'm, they are my cousins, it says okay. in the note. Okay. So that kind of ties her into the backstory. So she might use that information to convince the others to join her. Um, and then once they do, they'll meet in a, a tavern or they'll meet outside the gates and Gundren will give them the quest. So that's kind of the way that you tie in this. You can make it up or you can use half of what they tell you and half of your own stuff. It really doesn't matter as long as it kind of makes sense and everyone's happy and you all kind of meet up and get to know each other. So that's the first part of this adventure hook is really getting the group together. It even explains like how that's supposed to work. So most modules don't do this for you. And that's what makes this module great because it talks about role playing and inspiration. And then it goes into the Forgotten Realms to explain a little bit about the, the story of the area. And if you click on this low resolution map on the very bottom in the Forgotten Realm, you'll get this small pop-up map that you can share with your players. And in order to share this with your group, or if you want this available, you right click on the pin on the very top left of the frame where the map is, and there's that little round circle. If you right click on it and click sharing, and then share record, this will be available for your players. So if they're connected, it'll actually pop up. If they're not on the table, and you don't say anything about it, what you could do is first, you're gonna put it on your research. That will make this so much easier to find it. And then you can use this research for your session zero and put it down in the hotkeys. So if you accidentally close it, you pop it right back up where you left it. And I kind of want to keep it here by the characters. And then the map itself, I'm going to again position it where I want it so the the party sheet I don't need this right at the moment so I'm going to dismiss this so let's click on the party sheet up on the top right corner or you can dismiss it from the xing out but once you bring it back it's going to go where you left it so if you move this out of the way and then you close it and you start working and playing and then when you bring it back up it's going to be where you left it. So try to keep your windows where you want them to pop up. You're not always going to know that in the beginning, but that's a very useful tip. So try to make it to where these windows come up the same, no matter how many times you click on it or where you need it. It's going to be there for you. And I went ahead and stretched that out a little bit. I'm clicking this toggle bar up here so I can have this zoom to fit tool. And it just kind of did its own thing. It fit, it fits the area, and then I'm just going to size this up. So this is what you would use to, to share with your characters. Now I have it on my notes for me, for convenience. I can put it down in the hotkeys. Uh, the next thing I could do is bring up the, the notes, which I've already done. And I'm also going to link this map in the calendar notes. So if you go to uh, all logs, and you bring up the last one we made, you could link this map into the player side. So I want to see if this works, uh, Shell.
Okay, it's shared now. The record's shared, and I drug it over into the journal entry. So you should have access to that map, technically. And you do. I see you down on the bottom left corner. It shows that Lady Shell has the map available to her. Doesn't necessarily mean she's staring at it, but. So were you able to bring that up, Lady Shell? Don't forget, push yeah. the talk. Yep. I, I was. Okay, good. So this is a way to leave the map for your players. And if they ever want to go back to it, it'll be in that journal entry. And this is where their, their home base is, basically. The next thing is since this is session zero and this is our kind of our reference map, I'm going to drag and drop this session zero onto the map where Neverwinter is. Players cannot see the red arrows. It's only for GMs. So I just link my notes to the map and my map is linked to the notes. So that makes it so it's harder to lose it. And then I also have a shortcut to my notes in the hotkeys. So that's one method of keeping organized is having these notes per session. And you're only going to gobble the stuff that you want to work with. You don't put everything on here unless you're like that, uh, unless like an index. But in this case, I'm only worried about this stuff here. I'm worried about who my players are, what day it is, and the things I need to read. And then we'll do our session zero. We'll start Neverwinter. We might do a little role play. Maybe I'll do a little encounter or something just to test everyone out and make sure everyone's gelling properly. And that's about it. And then we'll plan for session one. So if there's any questions in the chat, be a good time to ask. I'm going to start setting up for session one, and that's where the actual combat is. So if anybody has any questions so far, go ahead and ask. I am going to move on to the next piece of this uh, lesson. So we're going to assume that session zero has been done, and we decided as a team, as a group, that we're going to get together on the 27th. So I'm going to double click on the 27th. I'm going to set the calendar by clicking on the arrow on the top. And now the calendar is set for that day. And now I'm going to make a new note. And this is going to be session one. All right, here's session one. Now I'm going to link this date here onto session one, because this is the day we're going to play. If there was a time, I would add that as well. In this case, we're going to play at the same time, so I don't really have to notate anything unless I wanted to. But if I did, I'd just send the time over. And then the note itself, I will link it to the Game Master side. And then for the player side, I might type a note like Neverwinter. Session 1. And then the players can put whatever they want in there. So that is basically... Uh, the beginning of the records for keeping track of the stuff. And then I have them both linked back and forth. So the calendar is linked to the note. The notes is linked to the calendar. Also, being that this is session one, being that I've done this before, there is a thing about they're going to leave Neverwinter and travel to Phandalin. So I'm going to put the notes on the map because they're going to start right outside of town and head south to Phandalin. So that's part of the setup here. So now I have the calendar set. I have my notes going. I have a basic map to get an idea of where we're going. So Phandalin's down here, and we're going to start up here. So the first session, I want to try to get up to this. There's a uh, goblin ambush that comes up. I want to get to that point for the session. 
So that's basically as far as I want to study or worry about until I need to worry about more. So for session one, I need to know when we're going to play. I already have the notes from session zero for the player. So if I need to pull that up, it's in my notepad here. And I'm going to steal the map link from session zero. So I want to take this image of the Sword Coast map and put that in there so I don't have to come back here all the time. And then I'm going to go to the story entry. I'm going to change the group or the chapter to Lost Mind of Fendover Part 1. It's called Goblin Arrows. And that is the stuff that we're going to use to run the adventure. So this is your research. So I want to put the index here for our ease of use. Uh, the Goblin Arrows is on the way to Fandolin. And then the actual ambush which is the combat that we're going to cover soon. And then if they make it, the Kragma hideout. That's about all you need to do for a two to four hour session. If you go any further than that, it's a long day. So the uh, hideout itself will probably take you, to, you know, at least two sessions. The uh, ambush thing should be your first session probably. So it really depends on how much you play and, and that sort of thing. But as a marker or as a thing of note, um, if you get up, if they find the Kragma hideout, that's a good stopping point. So now that I have those in place, now I'm going to start looking through the actual data and figuring out what I need to do. So if there's any questions up to this point, please ask, because we're going to start really getting into building the encounter or setting it up to be ran. And this is done before we play, not during, not after, before. And then I'm going to make this bold. Okay. So here is the research area. Um, so the index is going to let me jump around and read ahead if I need to. The Goblin Arrows section tells you what happens between the start of Neverwinter and reaching the ambush. And it details what you're carrying, The uh, you're escorting a wagon, and it tells you about the value and how that's set up. It's a, it's a two oxen pole wagon, and it's not very fast, so you're kind of... You're watching the stuff as you go down to Fandolin, and along the way, you will notice that it's full of certain things. And if you were ever curious about it, it has details of what's in there. And it's just supplies going to Fandolin. The total value of the cargo is worth about 100 gold. Um, when you're basically, when you've got all that situated and you're ready to leave, and maybe you've done a little bit of role play and then you have the information about the wagon. Now you, it says if you're ready, then you go to the Goblin Ambush section. So you click this arrow, and here I'm gonna have this set so it's basically in the same place. And I'm gonna use the bottom arrow to navigate. Because if you click on the pin, you're gonna have to resize the window. If you stay within the window you have and you use these arrow keys, it will stay to the same window size. So it says, read the following box text to the encounter, or to start it. So when you get to a certain point, and they have this photo up here, which is a picture of the uh, goblin ambush, supposedly, and then there's some of the information that goes to that to running that encounter. Actually, I move this pin for my own sake up to about here. Because it says there's a bend in the road, and that's where you get ambushed. So that's kind of why I do that. And then there's also a link to the hideout, which you don't find until after the ambush normally. So I usually recenter that a little. And then that's basically 
you know, the, this area is where you're going to be in for the next three or four sessions. So you should learn the landscape, what it consists of. You should know about the road, you know, that as a game master. You'll know that this uh, Leyland is south and that Fandolin is up in the mountains at the foothills. So you'll, and then Neverwinter Wood is to the north. So that's kind of what you want to know about as far as a game master goes for lore. Okay, so the Goblin Ambush takes place um, right after you leave the the main city, which is Neverwinter, and you're heading south. And as soon as you head on the Tribor Trail, you veer off and then you come into this ambush. So when you click on this little dialog box here, and it, and it says you've been on the Tribor Trail for about half a day. As you come around a bend, you spot two dead horses sprawled about 50 feet ahead of you, blocking the path. Each has several black feathered arrows sticking out of it, so the horses were shot. The woods press close to the trail here, with a steep embankment and dense thickets on either side. So this was meant to be theater of the mind. However, there is a photo that I use quite often for a map, or you can use your own maps or just do theater of the mind. So it's really set for theater of the mind, but if you want to use the, the visual aspects of a virtual tabletop, you are certainly welcome to bring in your own maps or use some of the assets that you already have. So in this case, if you don't have a map and you want one, you could do a, a few things. You can run everything out of the combat tracker, which isn't a problem. That's where most game rules, game sets actually use that. The other thing is having the ability to bring in your own stuff. So without doing all that, um, if you actually research the module and you come into the maps and images and you're going to filter it to Fandolin, there's artwork that comes with the actual book. And it's there's a cover, which I don't use that because that's a giveaway. There's a picture of these goblins. I might want to show that right after the, or before, right when the ambush springs, I might want to use that. So I'm going to take and drag and drop that into my notes here. And that might be something I want to share as we go through the module. So I'll use that as a, as a handout. And then there's another one that shows the Tribor Trail. So I like both of these images. They are available in the game, and they are part of the module. So nothing special there. And if I wanted to use this as my battle map, I could for Theater of the Mind style. You can put, you can line up the characters on either side, or you can lay this out tactically. And all you have to do technically is unlock this image, go to the grid mode, which is on the far right, and you could right click and add the layer like you used to in Classic and go to Set Grid and then just left click and drag until you get a grid size that you're, you're comfortable with. Or you can manually adjust it here. So it's at 47 and a half. I want to go to about 55 because my eyes are old. And it will auto size to whatever you need to. Um, it's linked together, so the ratio, aspect ratio is the same. And then those those lines are a little bit thick and obnoxious. So you can come over here to the color picker, and I'm going to put go with like a yellow so it's easier to see, but I'm also going to turn down the alpha, which is the kind of the, the transparency, so that it's not so obnoxious. So that way you can still see it, but it's not covering everything. So that's basically, you could use this as a battle map in a pinch if you needed to. That's one way. The other is the party sheet. In the party sheet, we talked about this in a different episode, but in the party sheet, you have a other tab, an order tab, excuse me. It also has a grid, and this can be used for, you know, a substitution for that image or for not having a map for using your theater of the mind. And all you have to do is go into the options menu and in the game master, the GM section, there's an option and it's called show 
characters to clients. That's the order tab. The other sharing is show inventory to clients, which is the inventory tab. So if you turn those on before the game, your players will have access to those. So you can use this in a pinch to sort of illustrate where the players are in relation to each other. You can even go into draw mode and draw things. I use this thing to illustrate elevation and height because top-down maps doesn't really give you that feel unless it's made vertically. So if you want to use the party sheet as a map or as a quick thing like having graph paper, that is an excellent way to do it. And you can also show your marching order like where you normally would stand. So this party, the, normally the fighters are out in the, the left and the right. Then the cleric is kind of in back a little in the center. The wizard next to her. And then the rogue kind of drifts around. So that's normally how they, they travel as a group. So you could set that up. And then your watch order would be who takes first watch, who takes second. You can do it in pairs if you want, however you want to do it. So we'll say that Lady Shell's character, the cleric, and the human, uh, the folk hero, they take first watch together. The human noble and the wizard take second watch. And the rogue kind of stays up whenever. He, he's third watch, but he's usually up or asleep when the uh, people wake up. So that means that your shift is roughly four hours or three and a half hours. So it just depends on how you set that up. But this is your, your party sheet. So that's another way to do it. The last and final way is to actually add the asset yourself. So if you buy something off the DMs Guild, or if you make a map, or someone hands you a map that they've made uh, for personal use, this would be a way to do it. So you go to your assets folder, and make sure that you're in images, not tokens. And then you'll have a data folder and a campaign folder. You may not have a campaign folder yet if you haven't added any artwork. But if you do, you would click folder, navigate to the campaign folder, and there's an images folder. In that folder, you will drop other folders or images that you want to use throughout your campaign. If you want those images to be available in all of your campaigns, you would repeat that process or do the same thing in data. So if it's only for Lost Mine, put it in the campaign folder. If it is for everything, then use it in the data folder. So I'm going to click on campaign. And here I have maps that were created by Chris from Game Tile Warehouse. So he's done a Meander's Lost Scrolls. And it is technically not a Phandalin uh, uh, set, although he's got all of the buildings, including the ones that are not in the module, and some road maps and all kinds of stuff that are related to this, this particular series. So I've already added the Cragmaw Castle, or excuse me, the Cragmaw Hideout, an area map, and then I'm going to show you how to add the uh, ambush map. So we're still kind of tinkering around with the idea of running with your own map. So you take and open up your maps and images. And I've already made this group, but it's called um, Lost Mind Add-ins Maps. I did that so I have my own group. You do that by clicking the down arrow, click the edit groups, and you'll make your own group. And I did this so I can keep them separate from the original campaign and from the other stuff. And now once I have that, I'm going to open up the, there's a folder here, and it's called uh, Goblin Ambush. And the big reason why we're telling you this is because the module itself does not come with this first encounter. It was all meant to be Theater of the Mind. So I'm going to open this up or preview it by double-clicking on the asset. Then you click on create image from record, or you can just drag it straight over and drop it in the window. 
and that pops up this really colorful three-dimensional looking colored map and then at this point you can put the grid on it which is the first thing you want to do and you want to lock the map so it doesn't move on you and I'm gonna go ahead and set this grid up and I think I want to set it at a hundred yeah it's even greater than that yeah I set it at 200 that's about right and that's because this map is high resolution and what that means is when you zoom in it doesn't lose that much quality so when you have a map that's at 50 it's better for your table because when you push that map or when you share that map with your friends it's going to be a lot easier on them if you use a big map like this it can cause problems with your table because this map is really huge so locally it's fine but when you push this over the internet and if your friends don't have very decent internet or they're using up too much bandwidth this map will take a couple minutes to load and it could cause their machine to freeze for a bit so be careful on what images you're pushing the ones that come with the module are usually pretty safe it's when you start grabbing these third-party things you have to be careful uh, chris did make lower resolution maps so if you're worried about this uh, you can you can uh, resize this any way you want this doesn't have a grid baked into it so you can shrink it or however you want to do it but in this case this is full resolution so be careful with that and then the grid type I'm just going to leave that I'm going to change the color to this yellow again and then I want to turn down the alpha and that way it's not as obnoxious so then I'll lock the map and then I'm gonna size it so I wanna kinda of center this a little bit so again I'll use this little toggle drop down on the top right corner next to the lock and I'm gonna shrink to fit and then or size it to where it's gonna fit this area and there we go so if I was gonna use this I would have probably have this up in the corner And this would be my viewable area while I'm previewing. But when it came to combat, I'd have it zoomed in. So this is kind of how you want to keep your maps is maybe a third of your screen, unless you got dual screens and you have them stretched across. So basically this would be my, my map that I was going to use. And then I can either you know, I could use the Tribor Trail map as just a handout now, or you can use that as your map if you want. But basically, I'm going to drag and drop this map onto my Session 1 notes, because I want to use that. And then I'm going to take Session 1, the notes, and drag it to the map. And then I might even take this ambush which is the combat part and link that too so it's so much easier to find it and i don't have to dig around and now the next thing is where is this on the map on the big map so i will link the big map to here to the smaller one or to the more focused map and then i'm going to link the big map or the little map where this fight is taking place. So you have all these things linked together. And that's very helpful when you are playing so you're not losing your, your spot. Now the next thing is the encounter itself. So supposedly when you come up to this area, there's a couple horses that are dead. So as you can see, there's no horses on here. You'd have to do theater of the mind or just pretend they're there or you can draw little X's, or you can go into your assets. And if you have horses in tokens or in your images, you could actually put them on there and even put a pool of blood or whatever. I'm not gonna do that for time's sake, but if you have them, you could dress the map up before the counter starts and, and have those available. So now what's happening is I'm gonna start setting up for the encounter. 
So it tells you that once you come up here and if you try to examine the horses, the goblins attack. It tells you what the encounter is like. So you have four goblins. Here's a shortcut on here to their stat block. Now, one thing you want to keep in mind is this little helmet here or this little status. It says hostile, so that's going to override. And when I send them over to the combat tracker, they'll automatically be hostile. If it's set to um, faction, it will take the stat block and it will set it to evil on its own. So this is like an override for the um, default. So if you want it to start off as hostile, if they're not normally hostile, you want to put it on hostile. If you leave it on faction, it's going to take the alignment from the stat block. So that's something that you should know about this there, as far as that goes. Now here, the ID, you can unidentify the creatures. So when you add them to the combat tracker, your players won't know immediately what they are until they see them. So that's another thing that, that could be handy. But nonetheless, this was meant to be dropped straight into the combat tracker, and then you drag it to the map and then run with it. Or you just use the combat tracker. However, this is an ambush. This is planned. It's not a random encounter. So I'm going to place the goblins ahead of time before I start my session of where I want them to go. So first of all, I'm going to link the encounter closer to where this is going to take place. So I'll set it there because that's going to be where the goblins little home base is. And then I'm going to place them on either side of the road like it describes in the, uh, in the uh, description here. So I'm going to drag and drop all of these individual tokens, not the single one, but all the individual ones into the squares. So I'll have one up there, one over here, I have one down in here. Then I'll have one up in here in the bushes. So this is where they're hiding along the road. So what it tells you, and this is important to know because normally the modules don't give you all this good information. So let's talk about what they're saying. So it gives you the description. It says, you've been on the Tribor Trail for about half a day. As you come around the bend, so here's a photo of the bend in the road right here. You can share that. It tells you that there are two dead horses and they're laying on the ground. Like I said earlier, you can add horses. Um, they're blocking the path somewhat because they're sprawled out. It says the wood, they have arrows sticking in and out of them. And it says the woods press close to the trail here with a steep embankment and dense thickets on either side. So they're talking about this embankment, this embankment, and then the, the thick bushes and, and trees. So that's basically how they have this laid out. And then it says for you, for the game master, if you're using the Meet Me in Fandolin adventure hook, which is what we suggested earlier, any character who approaches to make a closer investigation can identify the horses as belonging to Gungeon Rock Seeker and Sildar Hallwinter. Now you can just say they know the horses by getting closer, or I can ask, hey, Lady Shell. So I'm going to drag and drop all of the characters on the map first, and I can do that one at a time, or I can grab this symbol down the very bottom of the combat tracker. There's three factions friendly, neutral, Hostile. So I'm going to take the friendly helmet, which is in this case a helmet, might be a dragon, might be some other thing. And I drag and drop all of them on this sheet. No, they do not correspond with the order on the order tab for the party sheet. I wish they did, but they don't. So the criminal is back here. Like I said, uh, This is the, the starting location. 
of the group. So Lady Shell, there is a couple horses up ahead. Um, can you make a perception check, please, in the dice tower? I can't even see the map yet. Okay, good point. So I forgot to share the map. So to share the map with the party, you know, I'm going to right-click on the map and click Sharing, and then Share Record. That's better. Okay. Now I see a bunch of people in a gray blob. Yep. I can't see the map, what I'm saying. Right, and that's probably because it's huge. But the tokens are down in the gray area. Shouldn't the tokens be up? Oh. Yeah, don't forget, I have a 17-inch monitor. <laughs> I mm -hmm. don't see much. Right. So she's not even seeing the map yet. I've already shared it. So case in point, um, Lady Shell, close or make a bookmark of the map first. Close it. I, I zo did zoom to fit, and now I see it. Okay. So it takes a few seconds to load these big, huge maps. So if I used a lower resolution map, it would probably would have showed right up. So it took it a few seconds to, to render. So Lady Shell is rolling a, oh, so she rolled very high. I'm just going to tell you, I wouldn't normally tell you, but Lady Shell rolled a 20. So oh, hey, yeah. Go ahead I'm and, very perceptive. Go ahead and I move. I know, that's Gundred's horse. I recognize it anywhere. Yeah, exactly. So go ahead and move up 25 feet because that's where the horses are, basically. So if she's on the map you right now. To, uh, put the, the yes, hold on. Box so we can sh let yeah. me put myself So back. right now she is on the map. She can move wherever she wants. So go ahead and show that. Go ahead and move a little bit. So see, she moved up on her own. And that's usually fine when you're not in combat. But when it comes to combat, you want to lock the the tokens if you can or if it's feasible. So you right-click anywhere on the map, not on a token, but on a map, and you click Lock Tokens. Now go ahead and move your movement. Okay. 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 So there's so 20. 20, and then I moved up one. Okay, so what that means is she said she wants to move up there and take a look at the horses. I will check this if it's right. Now, let's just say there was a log in the way and it was too big. Then I would ask her to retrace her route as she climbs over the log. But then if she climbs over the log, she loses five feet. So it's one of those things where you kind of have to judge it. But anyway, so she's on the next to the horses. That's where they're laying. And it says that in the notes, it says, if you're using the adventure hook, someone can identify the horses as belonging to Gundren. Well, since she rolled a 20 on her initial perception, I would just give her the information and not worry about it. However, if she rolled lower, she would say, hey, those horses look familiar. And then I would have a roll investigation. And then she would determine that it was from Gundren and uh, Sildar. And then if she rolled a medicine check, because it says they've been dead for about a day, and it's clear that the arrows killed them. When the characters inspect the scene closer, read the following. And so I click on that, and it says, okay, Lady Shell, you see some saddlebags nearby, but they've been looted. And nearby lies an empty leather map case. So at that point, once she starts, you know, investigating, the goblins jump out of the woods. So that's how this thing works, or how it's supposed to work. It, uh, the actual information about the horses being dead, you can either just tell them that, or you can make them roll for it. I like the roll for stuff like that. Um, if she rolled high enough for investigation, if she had to go that route, I would just do go from there. And then I'd have her roll a medicine check. And being that she's a healer, it's probably halfway decent. So she didn't have to because her initial roll was really good. She immediately says, hey, there's some, those are their horses and they're, they look like they're dead. And, uh, but I do want you to make a survival check. And I'll tell you why in a, in a second. So I already have a value in my head. But if she makes a, a survival check, she's going to learn something else. Wow. So you actually rolled a 22. 
versus 12. So what you've learned is that these particular arrows belong to a local goblin clan, and they are not friendly. So what would you do with that information? I would say, I suspect it's the Kragma goblins that are responsible for these, the death of these horses and the miss, are the my cousin and Sildar being missing. Okay, so that's great. That's a good response. So now, at this point, this might trigger all of the, the players to be a little less uh, lazy or, or, you know, not paying attention. So I might not even roll, and then they would draw their weapon, and then the goblins would come out. You can handle it any way you want. But the way the encounter is written is it says that four goblins are hiding in the woods. So we already have that established. And if you notice, they're not visible anymore because I close the encounter. But once I pop it up, once I click on this uh, goblin ambush, and then I click the down arrow, it's going to put them on the combat tracker. So I can do that at this point. And they're going to pop up, you know, on the map where I put them. But they're not visible yet on the combat tracker or the map. They're just ready to go. So now that she's identified them, I can bypass a lot of the hoopla here, which is it tells you four of the goblins are on the other side of the road. Two of them are going to attack with uh, uh, missiles, weapons, and two of them are going to attack with melee. And it tells you that in the encounter notes. It says it's likely to be the first combat uh, in the adventure. Here are the steps you should follow to run it effectively. Now, these are steps that they recommend. You don't have to do this, but this is what they say. They want you to review the stat block on the goblin. So pick any goblin, or you can take the encounter base one and look at that. And you'll notice there's a stealth of plus six. Check to see who, if anyone, is surprised. So what I'm going to do is do this probably before. I don't know if I want to do something like this during play, but I will roll if I don't want to give the goblins away. I want to give the goblins a chance to ambush. So what I would do is roll the stealth roll before the players get on the table. They rolled a total of 18. So I can pull out the party sheet, go to the main tab, and down here at the bottom, and I'm going to hide the rolls. So there's these uh, group rolls. And there's a little eyeball here on the bottom of the party sheet, which says hide rolls. I'm going to change the DC challenge rating to 18. And they have to beat that number in order to notice if the goblins are here. So what happens is if anyone fails, then they will lose a turn, basically. Or they'll, they'll lose their, their attack or their action during the round. So let's go ahead and roll and see what happens. So this is a group roll. It can be done privately, so you don't give it away to the group if you're doing this during play. You can just roll this in the background. So I'm going to click on the skill as perception, and the challenge rating is 18 based off of the roll I made. Okay, so it says that the rogue failed. It says the folk hero made it. It says the cleric soldier failed. It says the human succeeded, and the wizard succeeded. So three out of two people... Um, not being surprised is a good thing. Uh, this encounter could be deadly. So if your party is completely ambushed, like everyone loses a turn, and the goblins get off their first um, attacks, it could really, you can really lose the whole party in this particular situation. So you can tailor this how you want. So since Lady Shell rolled that perception roll, I could say that they were ready to go and that there was no surprise and I don't have to go through all this. But if you want to give the goblins a chance and you know that your players are probably pretty good players, I would give them the the, the uh, ambush without rolling. 
But this gives it a more of a fairness. So they have a plus six on stealth. They roll the dexterity check or their, their stealth check, and they rolled pretty high. So the rest of the group has to roll above their sneakiness to, to detect them. And three out of five of them did. So that's not do too we bad. Do to roll an initiative first? You do not because you're not, uh, well, you could technically, but you just lose a turn. So go ahead and roll your initiative. Let me hope that it's better than the first one I rolled, uh, which was a seven. Okay. Which is probably not going to happen because my dex is eight. Yeah. Yeah, not too bad, though. Got a seven. I should have shut up. I yeah. got a four now. <laughs> yeah, so the goblins already have their initiative rolls. They're all different. And now I'm going to roll for the rest of the party. Lady Shell, I might end up resetting yours. So you're going to have to stick with whatever your initiative is, which is what, three? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I'm going to go to initiative, and I'm going to only roll for the PCs. And you're last anyways. <laughs> So I'll go ahead and roll. Yeah, through. that's why That's why when I make a character, I use a high dex. Okay. So according to this, the combat tracker, we just rolled for initiative, and it came out to be one of the goblins goes first. And it's one of these guys in the back, which I'm going to assume are the ones with the arrows. So he is going to pop out of the woods so he can move 30 feet. So to emulate his movement, I have to hold the Alt key. So he moves 10 feet, takes out his bow, or he already had it out. He actually draws the bow, and he's going to target Lady Shell, because she's right up front. So in order to do that, make sure you have the creature's token highlighted. Hold down the control key and click on the target. In this case, it's Lady Shell, her character. And then it says here, it says that target's cleric, and he also targeted himself, so we don't want that. So No, go ahead and target yourself. Yeah, he's only targeting Shell now. So once she's targeted, he can just double-click on the attack roll for the bow. The range is 8 to 3, uh, and 320, so she's within... 80 feet, no problem. So she's like 50 feet away or something like that. So what that's going to mean is I'm going to take and double click on the short bow attack, which is plus four to, to hit. And it missed. So it was blocked by her armor. So it went tink. Her armor just kind of, it bounced off her helm or something like that, if she had one, or off her shoulder plate. So she went, damn it, I knew it was those goblins. <laughs> so that's his turn. And one of the things they can do as a bonus action is that they have nimble escape. So as a bonus action, he is going to move back into the woods. He still has enough movement. So if I hold down the control alt key, He's moving back to the edge of the forest, and he's going to hide. That's a bonus action that goblins get. So with the hide, he's going to roll his sneakiness, and on his stat block, he has a plus six. So he thinks he's hiding. He's rolling an eight, but everyone else's passive perception is above 11. So I already know that he's not uh, he's not sneak. He doesn't think, basically he's not hiding. He thinks he is, but he's not. So he's still visible. I would, I would also think that when I had the arrow fly at me, I would know the direction that the arrow came Correct. from. Correct. I would probably let the rest of my party know. Uh, uh, he's squatting on down the, on the side of the whatever, road. Left or right. I don't even yeah. know which place they're yes. at. Yes, and that's going to emulate that. So he's not going to get any advantage from sneaking or from being hidden, because he thinks he is, but he's really not. You're like, hey, watch out, there's some goblin underneath the bushes that are shooting at us. Good thing he rolled in the tower and he doesn't know. Yeah. Hey, by the way, it uh, looks like you're using the extension, the mist uh, yes. extension? Yes, yep. Oh, okay. Just letting everybody know that's not a common thing. Yeah, for it just says it's blocked by yeah. armor. 
and it only comes up like 45% of the time. So it's just random what, what it says. In this case, it's good, just for flavor, it says that the armor blocked the hit of the uh, the arrow. So yeah, once I I'm done... Yeah, I think it's called the misflavor yep. uh, uh, extension. Text. Yep. It's free. It's I, No, it's not. It's on the DMs go. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and click the, the down arrow, which passes the turn. Now it comes to a melee attack. So this guy comes out of the woods. So he's moving to the road. So he's kind of a janky mover, but uh, he comes out and he hucks this, uh, he throws a uh, javelin at this fighter down here. So he has a javelin on his person, and he's probably only got one or two of them, but there's no way to keep track of how many exact javelins. So I'm just going to say one, and once he throws it, he can't use it again unless he recovers it. So I'm going to go ahead and again. Hold down the control key and target the, the fighter. And then I'm going to double click on the ranged attack, which is the second entry. The first one is for melee. The second one is for throwing. He connects. So he hucks this thing down, and the um, tip of it... Ouch. So that's some heavy damage. The tip of it just goes right into his thigh and, and damn near paralyzes his leg. So he took heavy damage. So he's got 12 hit points. He's down to like five. He took seven wounds. So he's hurting right now. So I'm gonna, now I'm going to advance the turn. I think the goblin's going to stand his ground. He's not going to hide. However, he is going to move for nimble escape. So he's going to disengage. So he doesn't have any movement rate left, so he's just going to stay there. So he used all his movement to get here. You got to remember that. They don't get an extra 30 feet unless they're dashing. So that is uh, the down arrow to go to the next, uh, next actor or co turn complete if you're a player. And now the fighter. So the guy that just got nailed, I'm going to click on his little bubble here. He has an ability called Second Wind, and just notice he doesn't have any arrows. So I'm going to give him 20 arrows. And I'm going to use the Second Wind, so if I click on that, that's one of his class traits or features. Okay, so he healed five, so now he's down to two wounds, so that he feels a lot better. And I'm going to click this little bubble, which makes that go away for until we rest. And then he has Fighting Style Archery. So I'm going to enable that because that should be on anyways. He's going to pull out his bow, and he's going to return fire. So same process. He's going to hold down the control key and click on the goblin, and it will tell you unidentified creature number three, which is the goblin, is targeted. I don't even see that character on the thing. Did you he's next to the woods. Dismal? Shouldn't I be oh, able you to mean the, Oh, you mean the second? As a player. There, now I can see it. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah, I forgot to turn on his visibility. So that's another thing you have to do. Okay, so now the next thing is the he's throwing this, or he's basically returning fire. He has his uh, plus two attack, because that's his class feature. He's more of a ranged fighter. And he, I'm going to double click, and he's going to fire his bow. So I'm going to go ahead and double click here on his sheet. 7 plus 6 is 15, or 7 plus 8, 15. So he's got the hit, and now I'm going to double click on the um, damage. Wow. So they just returned fire. That goblin got hit right in the gut, probably. And it's hurting. It's probably only has, I don't know, uh, it says... Oh, gee, he only has one hit point left. 
but that would be something the game master would look at, not so much the players. So now I'm going to hit the down arrow, and I'm going to go to this human fighter. Now the human fighter is basically uh, free to behave, however. So he is going to, I'm going to bring up his sheet. He can move 30 feet. And he's going to pull out his great axe, and he's going to move up towards the dwarf. Again, I'm going to hold the alt key. He's moving up here, actually. Moving up here. That's fine. And he has his axe out, and he's basically menacing the the goblin that just got hit with the arrow. And he has, let's see, I'm going to go to his, uh, he could throw a javelin back at him. So that's probably what he would do. But if he was role playing, he could use intimidation if he wanted to. Uh, so let's see if that works. So instead of throwing the javelin, he's going to intimidate the goblin and try to scare him away. So he takes his axe and he lifts it up in the air and he kind of points at him and threatens him, basically. So I'm going to roll the intimidation roll in the dice tower. Uh, he rolled an 11, so that should be good enough to frighten the, the goblin. So the goblin gets kind of scared. He cringes like, oh, crap. So that's his turn, basically. So he moved up. He intimidated the goblin. And he pulled out his axe. So he's just kind of, you know, showboating, like trying to get this guy to get out of the way or to move. So that's his turn. Little does he know that there's another one in the bushes. So this guy, he moves out. And again, he has his bow. So he is going to target the fighter, and he should be visible now. So he has the, the, the fighter targeted here, and it gives you the distance here on the, on the map. It's 55 feet away. So let's see what happens. So the goblin lets loose a volley, or a, an arrow, at the fighter. And he is able to connect. So now I'm going to roll damage. Ouch. So he also did heavy damage to this, this fighter. So their arrows are doing pretty good against these warrior types. And he does have second win, but that's an additional attack. So that's not the same thing as the other guy had, which was, uh, what was that, uh, that healing... So that's that. So that's his turn. And then if he wants, he can. Uh, he's going to reload his bow, basically. So now the wizard goes. So she is not happy with what's happening. So she's going to move. She's only moving 10 feet for now. And she is going to target one of the goblins or more so i bring it up her sheet and you go to this actions tab and you know when you're running this you're not going to have to run all these characters that's why it's taken so long because you got more people on the table so she's going to do magic missile so magic missile is 120 foot range so we should be okay there and she gets three missiles if she had second level slots, she could upcast it and get one more missile out of it. But in this case, she's going to go for these targets that are visible. So she's going to target this guy, and all she has to do technically is just drag the damage onto him because they automatically hit. So she took that guy out. So this guy's dead. So on the combat tracker, you'll see a little circle with a line through it. I went ahead and removed him off the map. Now she's going to target one of these others. 
So she's going to target the guy that just hit the fighter. So I'm going to drag this twice onto the same target unless he dies. So there's one. Didn't do a lot of damage, but better than nothing. And then the last missile. And they're kind of a purple color, by the way. So they look like lasers, kind of. So she uh, put a couple holes in them, and he's kind of smoking right now. So she did her thing. And now she's going to move um, behind the fighter for cover. And then I have to check off that she used her spell slot, first level spell slot. And I should enable her ancestry, even though it doesn't do much, but it, it's a note that she can't be charmed or put to sleep. So that's her turn. Now there's one more goblin that hasn't shown yet. So he is going to become visible. He's going to run out and attack the fighter. And the fighter is basically, you know, kind of engaged with the other guy, but the, he's, he turns and he sees the the goblin run out. The guy didn't sneak up on him or anything. And he has a scimitar, so he's just going to swing it. And he's able to connect, but he misses. So the, this warrior probably put up a shield or something or blocked it. Whatever. I don't think he has a shield. He has a two-handed uh, battle axe or a, a great weapon. So that's basically his turn. But since he missed and it, it went clang, he's going to disengage. So he still has movement left. So he's going to move back. And disengage allows him to move without attack of opportunity. So that was his turn. So now the rogue. He hasn't really done much, but he is going to move up behind the rest of the group. So I'm going to hold down the control key or the alt key. And he, he's uh, basically behind the wizard and the, the folk hero. He's going to pull out a short bow, and he's going to try to attack this creature in the woods. Now, yeah, the creature does have a little bit of cover. He's not hidden, per se. So the rogue is going to perform a sneak attack, and since he's next to an ally within five feet and he's hidden, he can execute. So if you go to his skills under sneak attack and you can read that up. Um, but anyways, he's going to use his uh, sneak attack ability. So he's going to pop out, you know, when he, during his turn, he should actually be here. And he's shooting into this creature, so I'm going to target it. So I'm going to hold down control, click on the goblin. Now I have to do minus two because he's shooting into the woods. But he gets uh, advantage in this case because the goblin didn't know he was there. He was hidden. So now he is going to make his attack roll with his bow. So I'm going to go ahead and double click on the attack roll to see if he makes it. And it's a critical. So Fantasy Grounds knows automatically to roll the critical dice, but I also need to apply the sneak attack damage. So I just put an effect on the rogue that lasts temporarily, and now when I roll damage, it's going to add the extra damage plus the critical damage. Uh, yeah. So instantly, that arrow shot through that guy's neck and went into a tree behind him, and he falls dead. So that is the rogue sneak attack, and then his last five feet of movement. So he's hidden behind this guy. So that's basically how he's able to execute that attack. Okay, Lady Shell, go ahead. Oh boy, I finally get a turn. <laughs> I was I keep wanting to attack the people, and you guys keep killing killing them off before I can get to them. So I keep uh, reassessing what I can do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to heal the uh, human noble, which is standing next to me. 
um, I am going to, okay, I got a question. Now, this is a dumb question, but I'm going to use a bonus action, and then I get an action too, correct? Like I could shoot an arrow and do a bonus action on my turn, right? Because the bonus action, I mean, I'm allowed both, right? Are you not hearing me? Hmm. Are you not hearing me? I asked you a question. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't hear it. Okay, I said um, I'm allowed to do an action and a bonus action, correct? Yep, if you have okay, one. So, so I could shoot a, my um, crossbow at a goblin and then use a bonus action on the heal the, the uh, human nimble that is standing next to me, correct? If it is a bonus action. It is a bonus action. What, which one is it? Healing word? Healing word. Okay, yeah. You can exactly do that. Okay, I thought so, but I just wanted to make sure I don't want yep. to do it a movement that's not allowed. Uh, let's so see. do your healing Wait word. Wait a minute. Or... You know what? <laughs> I don't have a crossbow. Nope. I have but... a trophy dagger. Who throw made the... this character? <laughs> this is not the way I would make this Hand character. axes are throwable. Uh, what is the distance on these, though? 20 60 i think the people are further than 60 feet away from me though we'll target it but yeah so you hold down the control key and click on your target and that'll tell you i did click the control key and i see that it's targeting the person but i don't see any like well you have to hover over to your yourself mouse over yourself and zoom in and you'll see the line, and the line has a number on it. I'm not seeing a number. A number. I'm seeing I a do. line, but no number. Okay. Well, it says, it looks like it says 60 feet. But it's well, hard the, to see. The hand axe can go up to 60 feet. Wait, let me see. I can't yeah, read 20, it. 60. Oh, but 60 means disadvantage, right? Uh, probably. Uh, and the trophy dagger, same thing. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I guess I'm not going to be doing that. Um, I could do a cantrip and a bonus action, can't I? Yeah. Okay. So I am, first I'm going to use my bonus action. I'm going to heal my, uh, human noble buddy here. And okay. hopefully get him back on the track. So explain what you're doing. I am, um, going to... On my sheet, uh, I go to my healing word, which is under my spells level one, and yep. I open up the um, magnifying glass, and then there is a second line that says heal, and I'm going to grab the little plus sign or heal sign, and it should do 1d4 plus six, and I will drag my dice and drop it on the human noble's uh, token. Nice. So you did oh, a total of him, 10. I gave him 10, but he did not, He only needed 8. So he's nice. fully healed. The great and then heal. I will check off a spell slot. Mm -hmm. And then my second part of my move, uh, second part of my um, turn is going to be using Sacred Flame, which I am allowed to use on unidentified creature number 4, which I already have targeted. Now, you're going to have to move. I the soldier. Yeah, and you have to move a little. Because it is a dexterity thing. So you can't cast it from right there. You need to move out of... Th He's because in your way. Because the guy's in the way? Yes. You can move to the left or to the right. Okay. Okay. So 15 feet up here. All right. Okay, so now I have a clear shot at him. I'm going to mm -hmm. use my Sacred Flame spell and hope that, you know, it, this is probably a really bad move because I know that goblins are very dexterous and they're probably going to make the save. But Never know. I'm going to try it anyway. Yep. It's it's a it's a cantrip. It's not costing me a spell slot, so I'm going to try yep. it. Yep, yep.
Nice. They no, made the not save. Nice. No, I'm happy they, they made the save. <laughs> oh, poop. So she okay, was right. It, the goblins were, were successful at the save. So this gout of flame comes out, and the guy kind of rolls out of the way. Okay, so he's wounded. He's already got a couple wounds on him. He's looking at his ally across the way, and he's thinking about getting the hell out of here. So he is going to move out. He's going to disengage. So he is out of here. So I'm going to move him into the woods. And if anyone attacks him, he'll have at least a plus two on cover or a minus two to hit. So I'll go ahead and drag him up there. And as he leaves, I shout, Coward, coward, you captured my cousin, and now you leave. Mm-hmm. You can just hear him shrieking because he's in pain. So he's off and gone. All right. So now it's the folk fighter. So he's going to move up and, and try to ascertain what's going on. Okay, so he moves up here, and he sees the uh, the uh, unidentified guy here on the side. So he will get a minus two to hit, but he's going to target that guy, and he's going to let loose his arrow. So all the minus two is going to do is cancel out his archery bonus. And he hit, and he's going to roll his piercing damage. And that guy's gone. So almost all the goblins are gone except for the one that fled. And what it says here in this group here is that you use the initiatives to keep track of who goes first. When the time comes for the two goblins rush forward, make melee attacks, and the other two stand X amount of feet away from the party and make ranged attacks. Um, it then says when the th when three goblins are defeated, the last goblin attempts to flee, heading for the goblin trail, which is where this marker is, and up here. So he's heading for the goblin trail. So here's the developments. This is the stuff that you normally don't get, including the stuff I just read, when you do these kind of modules. It assumes you know what to do as a DM. So you're going to have to learn how to improvise and how to make this your own without needing these crutches. So basically, um, Lady Shell, do you guys want to take a short rest or do you want to pursue the goblin? I would like to pursue the goblin because I would like to capture him and find out where my cousin is. Okay. So being that you say that, you're going to send your fastest people, probably the rogue and one of the other guys, after him. And then maybe you guys can just follow behind walking or whatever, or jogging. So the all to say that, you know, after a while you capture him. So it says, in the unlikely event that the goblins defeat the adventurers, they will leave them unconscious, loot them and the wagon, then head back to the hideout, which is the cave that you're supposed to find. Um, the characters can wake up later, and then they will buy new gear at Barathon's Provisions, provided they have money, and return to the ambush site and find the trail. However, the goblins might get captured, so if the characters knock them unconscious, what we're going to assume they, they are, instead of killing them, a character can drop the goblin to zero hit points, which means that they are unconscious. They will regain conscious after a few minutes. A captured goblin can be convinced to share what it knows. So there's a table or a link to what it knows. And basically, it's going to say... You know, what, what things that the goblins might know. They know that there's about 15 goblins that live there. Or they might tell you there's a, a leader named Clark. He's the chief. They have more information about Clark. And then there's a dwarf, and his map were delivered to Grohl, as instructed. The dwarf's human companion is being held in the eating cave. 
So those are the things that the, the cleric wants to know is like what happened to her cousin. So this is just a, you know, what, what sort of things can come out of being captured. And then he also uh, would talk about, you know, potentially taking them there. And if they take the goblin to the hideout at this point, you're going to avoid two traps along the, the trail. So there's a goblin trail, and there's two traps along the way. And if you have the, uh, the goblin, he'll tell you they're there. And that means you either get advantage on finding where they're at, or you avoid them altogether. So that's a good thing. And then once you're through that goblin trail, you'll be at the Kragma hideout. So that's a, you know, it takes about a half an hour or so to get to the, the hideout. Once you're there, you can call that a session if you want. You can probably show them a little bit of the map, like from a distance, like where they're at. But as far as awarding experience, you get to award two different types of experience points at this point. So we're going to start wrapping up the session. So Lady Shell, do you guys want to take a short rest after you capture the goblin? Sure. I think so some gonna, of us need to be healed. Yeah, so, well, probably. But I'm going to go ahead and do a... So I'm going to go to the menu, click on this eyeball and paddle up under rest, and I'm going to do short rest. And at that point, if anyone has any recovery, it'll come back. In this case, this fighter did. And he doesn't have any damage right now, so he doesn't have to do any type of healing if he wants. He has a couple hit points, so he can do his second wind, or he can just do his hit die recovery, which is here, so I'll do that instead. So he's recovered some of his hit points, but he doesn't have any hit die recovery left. But that keeps him from using his second wind, which is more like Can something... Can I ask a question? Sure. Why does my character have one temporary hit point? I don't know. It's probably just a, an accident. Like maybe something actually got pressed or something. Because it wasn't there earlier. Uh, the next thing is... Okay, so he's good. Uh, the goblin's captured. He takes you to the hideout. That's pretty much the end of the adventure. But you have a parcel here, which is basically uh, to be awarded for each player if you find the goblin hideout. And they did. So on the party sheet, on the experience tab on the bottom, on the right-hand side, there is a area that you award these two different kinds of things. So this is a quest reward. So I'm going to drag and drop that in there. And then for the combat itself, even though you didn't kill all the goblins, you're still going to get the experience. As a matter of fact, I might give you bonus experience for not killing the goblin. So that's something that you can I do. I think there is something in there that says if you don't, if you capture somebody that you get some, there's some kind of quest for that or, you know, okay. reward for that. I can't remember though. Okay. So I'm just, for now, I'm just going to give them the regular stuff. So if you guys didn't kill the goblin, I would just give you guys extra. I can just unlock this and change it to like 250. And then lock it and then award it. And now it's going to give you a little extra. Not much. So it's like 10 extra each. And then once you're done, once you've drugged those over, then all you have to do is when the adventure's over or when you're wrapping up, click award. And each player gets 50 from the encounter. And then each player gets 60 from the actual event. So you got, uh, you know, each guy got a hunt or each person got 110 experience from that whole thing. And that's how that rolls. There is no loot. However, if you loaded, uh, there's a third party module called Monster Loot. And if you have that, it's a third-party module from the DMs Guild. It has loot for every creature that's in the module. So basically, it would be a parcel that has some of the goblins' weapons and a couple coins. And then that would be awarded in the inventory area. So if I take a parcel, 
and I can make my own too. It's just handy to have that already made. So this module wasn't designed to give you loot for this encounter, but if you feel bad or uh, guilty or anything, um, you can go to uh, make your own group and I can call it custom loot. You can make your own group and then you can add your own parcels. So I might put a couple coins because it really makes no sense. If they looted the bodies, you'd think they'd have some of the stuff with them, uh, especially from the Gundren and Sildar, although they might have taken it to the base already. And then there's uh, maybe a silver or two. And then on this side, maybe some weapons and gear. But once you're done, you're going to drag the parcel over to here and it puts the coins in and any items that you have in here. And then when you want to sell it, you set the percentage. It usually defaults to 50. And then it would sell the, depending on that percentage, it would sell the items in your parcel area. Now, if you wanted an item, you can drag it to your character sheet or you can just leave it in there to be sold. And you can also drag stuff from your character sheet if you have access to this and you want to sell it into this area as well. So if this fighter wanted to sell his his uh, common clothing. I think we did that. Didn't we do that in a... I'm pretty sure we did that in another episode. But anyways, we yeah, we that. did the party sheet. But anyhow, that's enough for that. Um, this just kind of shows you the aftermath of what happens. Now, once we're done, everyone logs out. Then I will prepare for session two which will be the same process. I will go to the calendar. I will look at the map that I'm gonna be using. In this case, uh, I'll probably use the map that's built in because it already has all the pins, line of sights already done. If I wanted to though, I have another map that I could use that I brought up earlier. And that was the uh, Game Tile Warehouse, the Lost Scrolls one. And that has a lot more detail. However, uh, the Lost Mine of Fandelver map has all the line of sight and everything built into it. So if you want to redo all the pins and the line of sight, go for it. If it isn't worth your time, then just use the map that's provided. And, that, and that's what we're, we're going to leave this with. So we've been rambling almost two hours. So I think we're good on, on this particular piece. Anybody have any questions before we want to go? Because we're, we're getting um, too far into two hours now. No questions that I can see. I did put a link to the Monster Loot module if you wish to purchase it or check it out on the DM skill. Yep. Uh, the link is in the chat. Okay. Thanks, Shell. That was great. Um, thanks for the assist. The combat will go slower um, until your party members get used to their character sheets. And then this will speed up quite a bit. So when you're playing, it will make things much quicker if you're able to do this and you learn all the ins and outs and you learn how to control your NPCs and what they can do and your players will understand what they're doing. And it, it just gets really quick. So initially it's slow. It takes about an hour to get through that scenario. Uh, but I had a lot of explaining and such. So if I didn't have all that, it would probably be less. So if you take that combat and roughly estimate about an hour to two hours per combat, you'll have a rough idea of how long your session's going to be. So I would think that this first part would be about three hours at least for your first time. Um, after that, it'll, it'll get quicker and such. It depends on what's happening. Sometimes um, you never do any combat. It's all role-playing, exploration. So it really depends. But that's uh, pretty much it. I'm done rambling. Do uh, you got anything else to say, Lady Shell? Anything coming up or anything good? I um, was going to put uh, the link to the Lost Mine of Fandelver uh, playthrough that uh, the Fantasy Grounds guys are doing mm -hmm. on the Fantasy Grounds YouTube uh, channel. I think they have about five episodes in good. if you're interested uh, in watching it because I don't know how many let's plays are out there for lost mine of fan delver using fantasy grounds so this would be interesting to see people that work for fantasy grounds actually using the product okay that is great good good advice 
So if you guys want to see people actually playing, there's a weekly show that uh, Digital Dave is running. And he's running it for a lot of the employees and developers for Smiteworks. So they're kind of going through it in a way and checking it out and, and running it through Unity. So anybody have any questions? Because we're going to call it a day. Um, that that's concludes this. This will be up very shortly. Um, I think right after we get done. So do you want to call it a stream, Shell? Yeah, okay. there, I just pasted the link in. I thought I pasted it already, but okay. oh, it looks like I, no, I didn't do it. Okay. Yeah, I did do it twice, sorry. Okay. Anyway, watch it twice. <laughs> <laughs> hey, everybody, have a great Sunday. Thanks for stopping by and watching our stream, and we'll catch you again on January the 3rd, which we'll, we'll okay. be talking about something else. Yep. Um, maybe we'll be getting the maps. I'm, I'm not sure. We haven't discussed it yet, but we'll continue on with the information for Fantasy Grounds Unity A through C. All right. All right, guys. Let's call it a stream. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.